in this morning's lesson is the prophets and nameless others. Throughout this quarter, we've taken an in-depth look at the individuals who are recorded in Hebrews chapter 11. The lives of some of them cover several chapters in the Bible, while others are only briefly mentioned. Either way, through the lives of those recorded on the pages of the Bible, we have an understanding of what it means to live a life of faith. Ours is not a blind faith, as some would suppose. It's a faith that's firmly founded on thousands of years worth of solid evidence. Those lives that we have studied this quarter are but a small portion of the evidence that supports our faith. In each instance, we see that obedience to God always works for the best in every situation. It may not be the most pleasant path or the easiest path at times, but the assurance of the end result is what we're all working toward. Hebrews 11.39 tells us, These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. They may have been blessed in their lifetimes, yet in every instance the coming of the Messiah was still a future event. We have their examples to lead us to a similar conclusion. Eternal blessings await the faithful. Whatever good or ill may come in this life, those who will trust and obey have a future which will far outweigh anything we may experience here on earth. I was thinking, I was thinking about Brother Bernizer. I woke up and heard the news and thought, well, he received a better Christmas present than any of us did this year. He got to be in the presence of the Lord. How much greater a reward for our faith could we receive? There, there are riches to be had in this life. There, there are pleasures that can be experienced in this life. But nothing will compare with the goal that we're seeking to attain. In 1 Corinthians 15, 19, If in this life we have only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. This is where the unseen aspect of our faith comes in. None of us have likely experienced the immediate presence of God. Yet one has returned from that inescapable habitation to proclaim the eternal joy that awaits the faithful. Jesus, the Son of God made flesh. None can have peace with God apart from His saving grace. He came to take our place and empower us to overcome all the forces of darkness. We have each experienced both success and failure in our walks with God. This, too, is strong evidence which continues to bolster our faith as we move forward down the straight and narrow path. It's why disobedience brings wrath and obedience brings reward in every aspect of this life, not only in the spiritual. It's a reminder from God of the eternal principle, principles of His will. The very fact that humans acknowledge a basic moral code points to God's authority and sovereignty in all things. Far from hiding, God has made Himself known to His creation in all things. Looking at the evidence for faith, the only illogical and irrational response is to ignore God altogether. I'm getting into commentary here. In this, this series of lessons, we have studied 22 particular individuals with regard to their faith. The author of the epistle to the Hebrews commented on 10 of those witnesses. Others he merely named. Finally, he made mention of the, a number of evidences or works of faith, leaving the doers nameless. Excuse me. Some of those works called individuals to mind. But they apply more generally to a host of faithful men and women of God who had already been inspired by those named to follow their example. And the faith chapter sp still speaks to us in, this, in the dispensation of grace. It gives us a greater insight into the source and the foundation of faith that we have. It encourages us to push through the trials and temptations in order to receive that eternal reward. 
through Jesus, God experienced the fullness of life in these mortal bodies. It's something I've repeated many times in the series and probably throughout Sunday school, but we need to try to fully understand the depth of this truth. Jesus experienced the trials, temptations, and pain that God the Father in heaven was incapable of even comprehending in His eternal state. He, he was a perfect God. He, he's completely, he, he can't even countenance sin. He couldn't experience pain or suffering in heaven. But as a human, He was able to experience that, that, the difficulties that we all go through in this life. Prior to Jesus, God could see the suffering of His people, but He could not truly understand the depth of the impact on our souls. Hebrews 12 and 18 tells us, For in that He Himself hath suffered being tempted, He is able to succor them that are tempted. That is, He is now able to bring aid or relief to those who suffer trials and afflictions because He has experienced those trials and afflictions firsthand. The eternal and holy God of creation was willing to put Himself on our level and to face undeserved rejection from a fully human perspective. He knew rejection as God Almighty, but to comprehend it from our point of view was a far more enduring pain than he could ever experience in his eternal nature. In the Old Testament, the word faith occurs only twice. In Deuteronomy 32 and 20, it is used to, in connection with the reproof of Israel's failures. Children in whom is no faith. In Habakkuk 2 and 4, it occurs in a prophecy <clears throat> excuse me, of justification by faith as we experience it on this side of the cross. The Old Testament saints were examples of faith. We see it manifested before the institution of the law covenant, and we see it continuing throughout the disp dispensation of the law. We have noted the wavering faith of some, but more particularly, we have seen examples of obedience to the faith, even unto death. They simply believed God and took Him at His word. That is faith in any dispensation. Now, when Abram was called to come out of Ur of the Chaldees, this was blind faith. He had never been required to do anything by God before. He had nothing to base his obedience on but this call to go forth. Every instance in his life after this became a greater evidence to support the initial choice and every act of obedience after, afterwards. And so it is with us. At some point in our own past, we heard that call to come out and be separate. Our parents' faith was not sufficient to save us or convince us of the truth of God. We had to make that choice for ourselves. And every act of obedience and disobedience since has added to the evidence which supports our faith. We now know for certain that God will take us through future trials because we've already survived our own past by His grace and mercy. This is not blind faith. It's based on the evidence of God's faithfulness to keep His promises throughout our lives. Golden Truth, Matthew 23, 37-38 O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Commentary, part 1, the prophets, Jeremiah 1, 4 through 10. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set 
thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. Amos 7, 14 and 15. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. Part A, their call and mission. The most common understanding of the word prophet is of one who foretold future events by the unction of the Holy Ghost. The future could mean soon or later, often even centuries later. The Old Testament prophets spoke, spoke largely in this matter. But there were, there were prophets who foretold as well as foretold. I'm sorry, I've heard that statement since I joined the church, but on its face value, it still seems senseless to me. It doesn't mean anything. But this is how I understand it. In Nehemiah 8 and 8 we read, So they read in the book and the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. When, when ministers speak or when prophets have spoken, they are always relaying the will and the word of God to His people. They could be warning of coming destruction or affliction if they don't adjust their behavior, or they could be simply trying to help the people understand God's will more fully. Sometimes there is no difference between the two, and at other times there may be. Either way, we must receive the Word of God as coming from Him and not the individuals whom He may be using. <clears throat> we must be made aware of our own behaviors and how they line up with the will of God. We must be willing to accept when we're falling short so that we can step up closer to God instead of falling further outside of His will. We see how the children of God treated the prophets of old by elevating themselves and their unfaithfulness to Him by their unwillingness to hear and obey God's Word from His servants. If we harden our hearts, and refuse to oh, oh, receive, if we harden our hearts and refuse to receive the instruction and correction from God's ministers today, our outcome will be no different than theirs. The choice is ours. We can acknowledge our own failures and live above them in the future, or we can continue in them to our own destruction. We can receive a deeper understanding of God's word and draw closer to Him. Or we can be satisfied in our own superficial knowledge and lead others to share in our own unple eternal unpleasant fate. Deuteronomy 30 and 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. A New Testament prophecy is principally a foretelling, or perhaps a preaching with anointing of the Holy Ghost. The prophets referred to in Hebrews 11 and 32 were the Old Testament prophets. They were many, but only a few of them are well known because of the books which bear their names. Even, though, even these have come to be called the major prophets and the minor prophets, and not as a result of their spiritual status, but because of the amount of writing that we have from them. It doesn't mean that the minor prophets were less important. Some of them had words that were just as important. Just we have fewer of those words. There were prophets much earlier than those who followed the judges of Israel. For instance, Abraham was called a prophet. Also Aaron. As we noted earlier, Samuel was the last of the judges and the first of the prophets, referring to the age when prophets replaced the rule of the judges. Our lesson texts concerning the calling of Jeremiah and Amos are typical and largely self-explanatory. God did the calling, sometimes before birth. He set or placed Jeremiah over the nations and kingdoms, and his mission varied from time to time. He came of the priestly tribe of Levi, and his father was a priest. His prophetic ministry covered 41 years, and it concerned the prophesied exile, as well as the yet future events. Amos, on the other hand, was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore fig trees. His prophecy covered about 13 years during a period of great idolatry in Israel. His was a ministry of sharp reproofs and rebukes. 
Both had their purposes and a, and a particular group to whom they were sent. Some prophets addressed the entire nation, while others only addressed a, a, a tribe or a small area, such as one half or the other of the divided kingdom. But their words are still applicable to us to this day. If we hear them and the application to our own lives, we have the potential to do great things for the Lord and the souls around us each day. If we don't hear them, or if we don't believe the words from the past have any bearing on the present, we will miss out greatly, both in this world and on the, in the one to come. It will cost us and our loved ones much pain and hardship in this life. What God said back in Deuteronomy still applies today. Choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. So how is it that we choose life? By hearing the words of God, understanding the modern application, and then obeying at any cost. Life is available for all who will choose it. In part B, their sufferings. The Bible, record, re, the Bible record reveals much suffering by the prophets in order to be faithful to God's calling. For instance, Jeremiah was imprisoned in a filthy dungeon. Isaiah is said by historians to have been sawn asunder. Jesus spoke of the persecutions and mistreatment of the prophets. Excuse me. By this fact, which is clearly seen throughout the Bible, no one should begin to think that obedience to God will bring wealth and popularity in this life. The Bible itself is full of evidence against a prosperity gospel. Just as the Bible is a mirror of our own lives, it's also a mirror on society generally. What did Jesus say about the life of, of the faithful? In John 15, 19, and 20 we read, as Jesus speaking, If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Now, Jesus was speaking to His most loyal disciples at this point. If this was true of the, them, what makes us, what makes, sorry, what makes some suppose today that gain is godliness? Paul spoke against this corrupt ideology and proclaimed it foolishness to believe such nonsense. We are assured of difficulties if we're faithful. In fact, according to Jesus and Paul, such adversities as they faced were the proof that they were doing God's will, just as they should. The same will be true of us today. In part C, their faithfulness. Even in their moments of discouragement, their faith prevailed. The, the comments in Hebrews 11, 36-39 references their faithful endurance under the most trying of circumstances. This is exactly what it took to convince souls of who they were when they saw their ability to withstand the trials uh, with almost superhuman ability. It's not human nature to count it joy to suffer shame. Yet for the cause of Christ, this is exactly what happened when the disciples were imprisoned and beating beaten for preaching the goodness of God. Amen. Endurance is a critical aspect of the faithful Christian life. But for it to be seen most clearly, the trial must be all the more severe. The greater the trial, the greater the grace that's needed to overcome. This grace is seen by unbelievers, and it will draw souls to the foot of the cross in repentance. Just as Christ's suffering drew souls to Him, our suffering will do the same when we faithfully receive whatever this dark and evil world throws at us and we praise God for the opportunity to be His faithful witnesses through those trials and temptations. Part 2, Nameless Others. Part A, Things Done by Faith. Hebrews 11, 33-35. 
who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Some of these accomplishments were no doubt done by those who were named in the earlier passages of chapter 11 there in Hebrews. Others are left to conjecture. One, by faith they subdued kingdoms. Joshua and those with him conquered the seven kingdoms of the Canaanites. Later, David and his army subdued the Philistines, Moabites, Syrians, Edomites, and others. Others also won great victories. Two, they wrought righteousness. Abraham, Abraham, for instance, believed God and his faith was counted unto him for righteousness. Many were turned to the faith from idolatry. Three, they obtained promises. Joshua and Caleb are great examples in their stand when the other ten spies rebelled. Though it took 40 years, they both lived to enter the promised land. Now this example speaks to, spoke to me right then as I was studying this lesson. In this fallen world, the promised land was theirs for the taking. Still something was required of them. Something was required of the people. They were required to fight the enemy. Not only just to get into the promised land, but the whole time they were there, the enemy continued to assail them. Rather than driving them all out and destroying them as God had directed, they began to compromise and allow the enemy to dwell among them. This meant as long as they were in the promised land, the enemy was a bad influence on the people of God. This led to them eventually rejecting God before He sent an adversary in to take them into captivity. Because they were unwilling to do what was necessary, it cost them their freedom. So many today seem to be taking the same attitude. They're compromising with the world system and allowing it to have the preeminence in their lives. Current trends mock those who would lead souls to the fullness of the truth and claim that they are being too severe in their interpretation of Scripture. The same attitude reigned supreme just before the Israelites became exiles from the land which God had given them. Sadly, the tendency is for many in the church to lean on those same individuals who would reject the truth of God's Word in favor of a more watered-down version of it. They may not currently hold their opinions, but they support many of their public platforms. The harlot church will be made up of all those who reject the fullness of God's truth. Our support must be fully reserved for God lest we find ourselves caught up in their destruction, just as the Israelites did. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Separate, distinct, unique, these are all words that describe those who will be found faithful in the end. No amount of compromise is acceptable to God. And we will be required to fight against all that this world would use to tempt us away from the truth as long as we're here living in it. Four, they stopped the mouths of lions. Samson slew a lion barehanded, as did David also. Much later, when Daniel was cast into the den of lions rather than deny his God, God stopped the lion's mouths. Five, they quenched the violence of fire. Three Hebrew children were cast into Babylon's fiery furnace immediately came, come, to, come to mind. The fire was not quenched, but the violence of it was. Earlier, when the fire of God burned among the complaining Israelites, when Moses prayed unto the Lord, excuse me, the fire was quenched. Six, they escaped the edge of the sword. Moses was delivered from the sword of Pharaoh. David was kept safe from the the swords of both Goliath and Saul. Mordecai and the Jews were spared the sword of Haman. Elijah escaped Jezebel's wicked anger. Seven, out of weakness they were made strong. Jehoshaphat is a prime example. When the Moabites and Ammonites banded together against Judah, Jehoshaphat prayed. 
We have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. That's 2 Chronicles 20 and 12. In the morning, when they went forth to battle, they found only dead bodies on the enemy's battlefield. The army of Israel at this time was quite small. Yet when they trusted God alone and did not depend on those around them, the largest of armies could not conquer them. 2 Chronicles 24, 23, and 24. And it came to pass at the end of the year that the host of Syria came up against him. And they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people. And they sent the spoil of them to the king of Damascus. For the army of Syrians came with a small company of men. And the Lord delivered a very great host into their hand because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers so they executed judgment against Joash. But when God was rejected, but when they rejected God by looking to those around them who seemed to have similar goals, a small army was able to defeat their gathered masses. It's far better to struggle with a little and trust in God than to think you have it all and be, can be crushed by an insignificant adversary. God's way may not always make sense to our human notions of what we think is best, but our faith is seen and trusting that He can see the big picture when all we can see is the individual trials that each of us may be facing. Hezekiah also was made strong when, he, when God healed him and added 15 years to his life. They waxed valiant and, and fight and put to flight the armies of the enemies, eight, they were brave in their stand for right and waxed or increased in faith and courage. Again, David withstood the whole Philistine army and challenging Goliath. Then there was Jonathan and his armor bearer who won a victory over the Philistine garrison. Nine, women received their dead raised to life again. This was treated in Lesson 7 of this series. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> B, things endured by faith, Hebrews 11, 35-38. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and dens and, of ca and caves of the earth. The victories are seldom won apart from the paying of a price. To endure means not only to undergo adversity, but also to continue on regardless of setbacks or suffering. Now, looking back at this passage we just read from Hebrews, what would cause people to believe that we will no longer face adversity for the rest of our lives after we surrender our own, own will to God? I don't know, but I see the exact opposite of that sentiment recorded in the pages of the Bible. I'm assured of difficulties, but I'm also assured of victory if I don't allow the enemy to convince me that he's already won the battle. Because he hasn't. And he won't as long as we keep our eyes on the prize that God has set before us. You've probably heard it said, don't tell God how big your problem is, the problem is that you're facing but remind your problem how big the God is that you serve. Victory will be certain, but perseverance is required on our, half, on our part. We must continue to strive for the victories that have been assured us. We may, we may be certain of the outcome, but that doesn't mean that we're experiencing the outcome right now. Just because your bills are being paid and, everything, and all your friends like you and everything's going well in your life doesn't mean that the victory is won. The battles continue throughout our lives. Uh, there are those, we're talking about Brother and Brother Iser, his fight's over. But that's the only end of this battle. There, the, the, the Bible says there is no discharge in that war. It's talking about this life that we're living. This life that we're living is a war. It's a battle that continuously rages as long as we're drawing breath. 
The enemy will fight against our souls. He will do everything he can to discourage us. He'll do everything he can to convince us that there's no hope. But we have to continue to fight. We have to recognize that the trials that we face, that we're going to face on a daily basis, are the assurance that God is still working with us. If we're not fighting anymore, the devil already has us, has us beaten. If we're not experiencing temptation, it's because the devil has, us, has, us, has won. We've already surrendered to him. We have to continue to recognize everything that the enemy would do to try to trip us up. And when we fall, we have to get back up again. We can't just lay on the ground and say, okay, it's over. We have to move forward. We have to get up, wipe ourselves off, accept the embarrassment of failure, and move forward with God. It's the only hope we have of victory in the end. <clears throat> Part one, they were tortured, not accepting compromises in order to be spared. The tortures could have been physical or mental, beatings or inquisitions. The resurrection unto eternal life was preferred to the sparing of temporal life. Now listen to that. They were beaten and killed. Why? Because the individuals who were experiencing these beatings and the process of their own death counted it more important to be faithful to God than to worry about what little pain they may be suffering in this life. They were killed, but they saw the outcome. They saw the final victory that awaited them if they could be faithful. They endured the trial of cruel mockings and scourging, the mocking of Isaac by Ishmael or Elisha by the children of Bethel are possible instances, but the Philistines' mocking of Samson when at last they had captured and imprisoned him at the Feast of Dagon are more likely examples. It's probable that Joseph was, prob was mocked by Potiphar's wife when he was imprisoned for her lie. Three, they were stoned, sawn asunder, tempted, and slain with a sword. One Zechariah, apparently a prophet, reproved the princes of Judah for transgressing the commandments of the Lord. And they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Historians say Isaiah, having resisted some of Manasseh's idolatrous, act, idolatrous acts and ordinances, was seized by his orders and having been fastened between two blanks, was kill, planks, was killed by being sawn asunder. Tempted may mean darings and threatenings. Then there were the 85 priests of the Lord whom Saul commanded to be slain because they had defended David. Four, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. They were deprived of the necessities, comforts, and conveniences of life, possibly for a lack of means or support. They may have suffered shame because of their appearance and harassment for what they stood for or against. The desert and mountain areas may have been the only places of refuge at times. The dens and caves excuse me, may have been their only shelter from the elements or hiding places from their pursuers as when David escaped to the cave of Adalam when Saul was seeking his life. Then there were the hundred prophets hidden in caves in Elijah's day whom Obadiah dared to, be, to feed with bread. Again, what in these reports would lead us to believe that gain is godliness? How is it that a prosperity gospel could thrive if people would only read God's Word for themselves and read it with a desire to grow in their understanding of its application to their own lives? Now me, I, I don't know about you, I, this is just me. I, I really don't like my mistakes being pointed out. It's, it's embarrassing, it's unpleasant. But even more than that, I don't want my errors to be perpetuated to my own destruction, destruction or by my failures cost others their eternal reward. Proverbs 27 and 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. What's that mean? How's that, how's that apply to us? What, what's that have any bearing on me? It's far better for a good friend to warn you of a dangerous fault, even if it's embarrassing, than for an enemy to encourage us or stroke our egos to our own destruction. 
I don't like my, my, my errors being pointed out. It's, I don't. I really, really don't. Tell me. <laughs> Embarrass me. If you see me doing something, if I'm saying something that's incorrect that doesn't line up with the Bible, tell me. If you don't want to tell me in front of everybody, pull me off to the side after church. Let me know. Because I do not want to deceive myself and I do not want to confuse you as a teacher of the Word of God. It's not my desire to confuse. It's not my desire to mislead. It's my desire to help us all to understand the importance of drawing closer to God and having a deeper understanding of His Word and His will for our lives. Part C, things obtained through faith, Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. All these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they, without us, should not be made perfect. Their sufferings and deprivations were not without reward. Yea, theirs was the reward of seeing some things come to fruition, which for time were seen only by faith. One, they obtained a good report. A report to be passed on to all who have followed them. A report of heart assurance that faith which they died in and for would bear fruit in some better thing for future generations. <coughs> Excuse me. We who are in Christ are eyewitnesses and heart witnesses to that which they witnessed by faith. All on the Hebrews 11 roster bore witness to the coming Messiah and we know that He did come. We now have that as part of our history. They obtained a faith interest in the unfulfilled promises, believing that they would yet be fulfilled. They did not die disappointed or disillusioned. Like Abraham, they staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but were strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what He had promised, He was also able to perform." And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. It's Romans 4, 20-22. The reward that we should be seeking will not be found in this life. We may receive good while we're here, but if that's what we set our hearts on, we will be disappointed and we will run the risk of allowing that good to become our only goal in this life. And this is exactly what happened to the Pharisees and Sadducees of Jesus' time, but He told them three times in Matthew chapter 6, Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. They already received their reward. They were seeking the approval of man. They were seeking the approval of their peers, of those whom they considered beneath them. And they got it. But that was the extent of the reward that they would receive. Our ultimate victory will not be found this side of eternity. There is good to be had in this life. And all of it comes from God. But we need to understand that that is not what we should be seeking. Paul says, if, if, you're, if you're a servant and you can get your freedom, great. But don't let that be your point of focus. Keep God in all of this, in, in this entire series of lessons, the most important thing that we can get is that we have to keep our eyes on God. There's nothing more important than that. As long as He's our focus, the trials that we are guaranteed to face in this life, we'll understand that they're simply a part of the plan that God has for us. They're to strengthen our faith. They're to cause us to trust in Him more and receive the victory that He would have for us. Not only for our own benefit, but so that we can be a blessing to those around us. I think, going back, uh, as I mentioned earlier about the, the disciples who, who were imprisoned and beaten. And when they came out, they were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. They counted it worthy. They counted it, it, it glory. They were blessed because they were beaten. How many of us would look forward to the trials that we're going to face when we go back to work? How many of us look forward to, to traffic on a commute? How many of us look forward to seeing the bills come in and, and recognizing that our bank account's not covering it? How many of us look forward to those kind of things? 
And those aren't trials of the faith. Those are trials of life. <laughs> those are simply things that we all face. But they, were, they counted it, they, they, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. When we can do that, when, when we come to that point in our lives, we know that God is with us. We know that God is strengthening us and causing us to be the people whom He would have us to be. That's not to give us a big head. That's not to, to increase our ego. But it's to help us to understand the, the hope that we have is only found in God. The strength that we need can only be found in God. Bank account's nice, but it won't get you out of every trouble. A nice insurance policy is good, but it's not going to resolve every situation. Every one of those trials of life is an opportunity to be a trial of faith. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have to keep our eyes on God. If we keep our eyes on God, He'll take us through all things. If we allow this life to hinder our vision of God, we're in trouble more than in this life, but in our eternal lives as well. I got about a minute. Any comments, thoughts, complaints? Anyone want to point out a failure of mine? <laughs> Brother Chris, these who, who face these great trials and had great faith, no doubt their faith started out 